Mr. Moid Yusuf, you are the director of South Asia programs at the US Institute of Peace. You have been engaged in expanding the Institute's work on Pakistan, South Asia since 2010. And your current research focuses on youth and democratic institutions in Pakistan, policy options to mitigate militancy in Pakistan and the South Asian region in general, and the U.S. role in South Asian crisis management. You have been widely publishing in national and international journals, professional publications and magazines. Today we would especially like to talk about um, the publication Getting It Right in Afghanistan, in which you were co-editing. Mm -hmm. Would you please be so kind and give us a um, summary introduction of it? Well, um, it's a fairly disturbing uh, summary that I'm going to give you. And essentially, this book uh, compiles a lot of work that the U.S. Institute of Peace has done on Afghanistan and Pakistan over the past five or six years, looking at the political settlement in Afghanistan, uh, the regional angle of that settlement. And the conclusion we draw, quite honestly, is that even things that were written five, six, seven years ago remain entirely relevant. So in some ways, a lot has changed in Afghanistan. In other ways, when it comes to political settlement and the peace process, not much. Uh, and so we bring together a, a host of literature uh, that we've produced previously uh, to suggest that a reconciliation and the peace process remains as difficult, but the answers are very well known. It's about trying to make sure that we can get to them, and that's where we failed so far. Why did you and the other authors decide to discuss the political settlement process in this particular way? Well, we believe that unless you get to a political settlement in Afghanistan, uh, no matter what changes you can bring, uh, the peace will be still very tenuous. Uh, you can look at the elections. Elections are crucial. Uh, the security transition is crucial. But ultimately, unless you get the political peace settlement along with the political transition in the elections, uh, it's very difficult to see how the insurgency will end and peace will come to Afghanistan. Who are the drivers of the insurgency on a regional level? Look, I think fundamentally the Afghan insurgency is an internal phenomenon. Um, the, the regional actors have exacerbated the problem in some ways. Some have tried to mitigate it, uh, given their own interests. But, but to say that the Afghan insurgency originates outside Afghanistan, I think, is a bit of a stretch. So I would argue there are countries, all countries, have operated in self-interest. A lot of times they haven't helped the cause of peace in Afghanistan. Uh, you can talk about Pakistan, Iran, the Central Asian republics, uh, all neighbors virtually. But, but the real problems lie inside Afghanistan. Uh, what could be the drivers of the settlement process? Well, there are a number of them. Look, there's governance. Bad governance is certainly one. And uh, the fact that the Taliban feel that they're part of the political process in Afghanistan rather than an insurgent force is another one. Uh, then there are spoilers, the extremists, Al-Qaeda, there are um, other Central Asian actors who are present in the Pakistani bordering regions and in Afghanistan. They're certainly a problem. And then some would argue that foreign troop presence in some ways has, has uh, caused the insurgency to flourish even more and the extremists to use that messaging uh, to, to, to push the government in Kabul further through violence. So, so there are a number of them uh, external, but primarily internal as well. How are the regional or neighboring countries involved in this process and what role do their particular agendas towards Afghanistan play? I think Afghanistan, unfortunately, for years has been the proxy battleground for its neighbors. And not only its near neighbors, but also its far neighbors. You saw the, the Soviet invasion and then what played out in the 80s. But over the past 10, 12 years, I think all South Asian uh, countries, Central Asian countries, Iran, all have operated in self-interest. Sometimes they've helped the cause of democracy in Afghanistan, uh, like the Bonn Agreement and Iran's help in the beginning, uh, Pakistan's support to President Karzai uh, through this process. At other times, the sanctuaries in Pakistan, the Iranian, alleged Iranian support to the Taliban, uh, the Central Asian republics playing um, their northern favorites over the southern ones. So everybody's really played their own 
uh, game in Afghanistan to Afghanistan's detriment at the end of the day. Even if they've helped in some cases, I think it's a net negative uh, at the end uh, for Afghanistan. Speaking about the role of Pakistan towards Afghanistan, um, how is the relation between the two countries? It's schizophrenic. Um, for, for years, uh, Pakistan's people-to-people -people relationship with Afghanistan and especially the Pashtuns of Afghanistan. Uh, remember, Pakistan has more Pashtuns than Afghanistan does and Pashtuns uh, are, are um, known to be the majority even though there hasn't been a census for a long time in Afghanistan. So the people-to-people -people relationship is very good. Uh, but the state-level relationship has always been dicey because Afghanistan um, was, was the last state to recognize Pakistan in the UN when Pakistan became independent. It still claims part of Pakistani territory um, in the northwest of Pakistan as its own. So there are a number of problems at the state level. But ultimately, given the geography, given the ethnic um, uh, composition, there's no way that these two countries can work without each other. What are the changes that have taken place in Pakistan's and Afghanistan's relationship since the international intervention in Afghanistan? Well, a lot. Uh, and sometimes we don't give credit uh, to how much has changed, at least in the urban Afghanistan. There's tons of development, a lot of work has gone in, which is not reversible to my mind. Um, the Afghans are not going to give that up just because somebody wants them to. Um, in the Pakistan-Afghanistan relationship, unfortunately, there's been a lot of tension because Pakistan has been seen and sometimes unfairly seen as the cause of all ills in Afghanistan, which is certainly exaggerated. Uh, but the Kabul-Islamabad relationship has been very tense. It was uh, very much a hostile relationship some years ago. It's improved, but still the tensions remain. Coming back to the time since the elections in Pakistan in 2013 and to the Nawaz government taking charge, what has changed since then? I think nothing has changed uh, by the change of government in Pakistan, but given the circumstances in Afghanistan, um, now I feel that Kabul, Islamabad and the, the, the Western countries are coming closer to each other's viewpoint. The viewpoint is that there's no military victory possible in Afghanistan, so the reconciliation, political reconciliation is crucial. Uh, the elections and a smooth transition is crucial. And then the ANSF funding uh, remains very crucial for the future of Afghanistan. Finally, Pakistan has now formally said that it doesn't want America to pull out completely and for the NATO troops to leave behind it. So, so I think the broad level, there is convergence that you'll have to find all these compromises. Uh, the problem is I don't think anybody knows how to make that happen. That's where the real problem lies right now. What policy interests does and should Pakistan have? Look, the bottom line, despite all the troubles that Pakistan and Afghanistan have had, is that they understand. They are locked in at the hip. The geography does not allow them to operate separately. Afghanistan is landlocked. I've already talked about the Pashtun element. So any real instability in Afghanistan, the fallout will come on Pakistan. So where they come together completely on the policy issue is that Afghanistan must stabilize. Pakistan has no appetite for uh, fresh inflow of Afghan refugees as it did in the 80s. Uh, the economic costs were very high then, they'll be higher now. Ultimately, uh, both of them know that they have to get Afghanistan to peace. Uh, the problem is how Pakistan thinks it should get there has not been the same as uh, Kabul and the international community think. What are the differences on how Pakistan and the international community look on this? Well, Pakistan has been much more focused on this reconciliation piece. Because of the sanctuaries in Pakistan, Pakistan's number one effort has been to get the Taliban back into Afghanistan through a political deal. And I think the international community and, and definitely actors in Kabul were very hesitant to letting that happen till very recently when it's clear that the international community is pulling out and the military victory has not come about. The idea of the troop surge was ultimately to degrade the Taliban Pakistan was never on board with it. It wanted a political reconciliation without pushing the surge to the point uh, where military victory may take place and the Taliban may actually not go back to Afghanistan because that hurts Pakistan's goal of taking on its own Taliban factions uh, and, and taming them ultimately. 
How do those interests match with the Afghan government's interests and expectations towards Pakistan? Well, look, as far as stability is concerned, they're on the same page. Uh, how to get there is the question. Uh, one of the flaws in Pakistani policy over the years in Afghanistan has been that it's been narrowly focused on picking favorites within the Pashtuns of Afghanistan. Uh, the broadening of the policy hasn't happened to non-Pashtun elements, the erstwhile Northern Alliance. And a lot of the government in Kabul has actors which belong to that erstwhile Northern Alliance. So that tension has remained. Pakistan has reached out over the past year or two, but there have been very modest steps that have been taken. So I think that's one level of tension. Second, if I may say so, I think there's been uh, a fair bit of conscious and deliberate effort on the part of actors in Kabul uh, to portray Pakistan as the number one uh, reason for problems in Afghanistan, which I think is factually incorrect. Pakistan definitely has not done enough uh, to tame the presence and the inflow of insurgents from its territory into Afghanistan. But if somebody were to say that Pakistan stops this and Afghanistan becomes peaceful, I think that's going too far. How far are the real issues of conflict really addressed in the recent talks between the two countries' elected leadership? I think the focus recently has been on two transitions, the political transition and the security transition. The political one that Pakistan wants the elections to go well so that Afghanistan doesn't fall into chaos. It wants to help in the peace process following that. Although I will say that I think we often exaggerate the influence Pakistan has on the Taliban. So I don't know how much it will be able to do, but it wants to try doing that. And then it's desperate to make sure uh, that the international community continues to uh, put in resources, material resources into Afghanistan, uh, because the history tells us uh, as soon as the Soviets pulled out their financial support to the Najibullah government, it fell. And nobody wants to see that happen again. What are the institutional arrangement made in both countries, or particularly in Pakistan, to bring forward political discussions and negotiations about economic development? Well, they have, uh, of course, trade agreements. Uh, they have now also have a transit trade agreement, which is actually not very functional right now because Pakistan is hesitant to let uh, overland rights um, be given to India. Uh, there is the Afghan transit trade, which has stayed on for a long time. Uh, Pakistan's uh, Afghanistan is now Pakistan's third largest export destination. So a lot of things have moved on the economic front. The problem is as soon as the security aspect comes into it, uh, the economic ones get wiped away because the tensions then rise again over the Taliban and, and the insurgency. Where I think they really need to focus now, more than trade, is investment and energy. The real potential is collaboration on energy for regional benefits, uh, be it through pipelines, be it through electricity transmission, uh, or be it through any other means. But energy to me is the real, uh, has the real potential of tying these countries together in a way that they cannot afford to have tense relations in the future. Could you elaborate a little bit more on the energy sector and also on the meaning of the water management in the region? On energy, look, I mean, there are a number of plans there. Um, you've got the Casa 1000, which is a plan for uh, electricity transmission lines to be laid, which is happening as we speak. There is the TAPI pipeline, the Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India pipeline. And there are a number of other thoughts on trying to flow energy through Central Asia into Afghanistan and into Pakistan. All of these, I think, are great ideas. How do you operationalize them? They're the number one problem even more so than investment, is security. Until Afghanistan gets to some level of stability, until Pakistan's Balochistan, the state has some writ, it becomes very difficult to get these massive pipelines coming through. So I think this is futuristic, but if you were to find a silver bullet here for these two countries to get along well and for the region to prosper, I think it's absolutely energy will be the one. In terms of the water treaty, uh, my own view is that I think water is an issue. Uh, but it's not nearly as big an issue, uh, issue as it has been made out to be. I think in the future, both countries are going to be water stressed. All the region is going to be water stressed. Uh, but treaty, I'm all for it. To say that this should now become the mainstay of 
showing that Pakistan and Afghan relations are improving, I think that's not enough. We need to go to larger investment issues, to energy issues, and to other bigger problems. Is there any chance for a win-win situation for both countries? I think this year is crucial. If you can find uh, political, economic and security transitions in Afghanistan that keep the country peaceful, that keep the country from falling into chaos, I think you've got a real opportunity there. Uh, if things start going wrong in Afghanistan, then you will find much more hedging from Pakistan, much more support to the actors it prefers, um, much less willingness to take Afghan refugees and all sorts of tensions that come with it. So really right now all the eggs are in, in the basket of the Afghan transitions and I'm cautiously optimistic because uh, Pakistan, Afghanistan and the US and the international community seem to be on the same page on what they want. Whether they can pull it off, whether the Taliban can be uh, persuaded to, to join the political process, etc. Uh, we'll have to wait and see.